Welcome everyone to a conversation with Jonathan Zimmerman. I'm delighted to welcome you all tonight to our event. Um, this is a virtual event and we're very excited to have you here as we delve into the past, present and future of college and university teaching in America. My name is Amna Khalid and I'm the John Stuart Mill Faculty Fellow at Heterodox Academy. As I'm sure many of you know, Heterodox Academy is a nonpartisan nonprofit group dedicated to improving the quality of research and teaching through promote, promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. Our tagline goes, great minds don't always think alike, and we stand by that. It's a pleasure to be joined tonight by Jonathan Zimmerman. John is a professor of history of education at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's also one of our founding members. Um, he's the author of many books. And tonight we're here to talk about his latest book, which I've had the pleasure of reading, The Amateur Hour, A History of College Teaching in America. It's going to be released next week. And anyone who's interested in education, you should really read this. Um, this is the first full length history of college teaching in the United States from the 19th century to the present. It sheds new light on the ongoing tensions between the modern scholarly ideal, which is scientific, objective, and dispassionate, and the inevitable subjective nature of day-to-day -day instruction. Now, before I turn to John to start our conversation, I want to give you a quick rundown of our plan for this evening. We'll start with a few questions that I'll pose to John, and we've dedicated the second half of tonight's conversation to sharing your questions with him. You can submit your questions by typing them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. When you submit a question, it will be received by, by our behind the scenes team who will elevate questions to me to ask. We have a particularly large audience tonight, so obviously we won't be able to take all questions, but we'll do our very best. And as always, uh, let me remind you, we welcome constructive disagreement, so feel free to ask questions that are challenging as long as they're asked in good faith. So without further ado, let me get the conversation going. Welcome, John. You have to unmute yourself. And thanks to HXA uh, as well for sponsoring all of this. Well, thank you for making it tonight. And let me begin by saying how much I've enjoyed reading this book. It's a tremendous journey you take us through starting in the 19th century up until pretty much now. And I'm amazed at how much you've packed into a small little book. As a historian myself, I am interest to, interested to ask you all kinds of questions, but I'll begin by, by just kind of highlighting how you've posed the question that there've been so many attempts to change college teaching at the undergraduate level in the US. And all those attempts at reform somehow have failed in some way, shape or form. And you talk about how, you know, the, the phrase that sticks out in my mind from the book is it's old wine in new bottles. Of course, there's been change, but at some level it remains the same. The more it changes, the more it is the same. And you've kind of tracked this. I'm not gonna reveal what the answer is, but you do this through what, a method that particularly is appealing, which is looking at the tensions at every level. You look at the tensions on professors between research and teaching. Um, and then you talk about the tensions in the mode of instruction itself, lecture versus small group discussions, what's the tension and how that's evolved over a period of time. Then of course the all present tension between students as citizens or consumers um, and um, the biggest tension I think which you talk about is the, the idea of the personality and how teaching is such a personal endeavor, um, yet there are all these attempts to kind of standardize it and to professionalize it. And that and herein lies the, the kind of gist of the book um, and that you're grappling with the question. So let me begin to, by taking a step back and asking you, tell us a little bit about why did you write this book? What's the background? Well, first of all, I just want to say that your summary was better than the one I wrote for the book. So I should have actually hired you to do that. Um, the reason I wrote the book is several fold. First of all, teaching has always been a huge part of my identity and my personality. Uh, it's the most important thing that I do. And I've always felt that way. And so I was curious about its history, um, uh, why it's changed and most of all, why it hasn't. 
uh, but I also live in the present, just like all historians do. And there were present day questions and concerns that motivated the book, which I think goes for most histories. And one of the stories I tell at the beginning of the book is that maybe six, seven years ago, I was at a debate about a very relevant topic right now, online instruction. Uh, this is well before we knew that all of us were gonna have to do it. And you know, it was what I, I, I say in a jocular way, it was the futurists versus the Luddites. And the futurists said everything was gonna be better in the online world, uh, maximal access and all sorts of different variants and options. And the Luddites said that everything was going to be worse. Um, and one of the things I realized at the end of the talk was what they had in common. What they had in common was they thought they knew what the baseline was. If you wanna say that everything is going to be better or that everything is gonna be worse, you must have at least some implied notion of what that everything is, what the baseline is. And I, I think that we didn't. And that's why I tried to, that's, that's what I tried to do in the book, which is provide that baseline. You know, look backwards to, to, to try to examine how teaching happened, um, how people tried to change it, um, what actually changed and what didn't, so that we could have some sort of baseline from which to have that dialogue. Fantastic. And so you started off, I mean, this is done over, like, you talk about going to 59 different institutional archives. Tell us a little bit about the process of collecting the material that you then go on to analyze. Well, first of all, I wanna give two more shout outs. First to the Spencer Foundation, which gave me the money to visit those 59 archives. Otherwise I couldn't have done it, it wouldn't be a book. And also before I forget, I want to give a special shout out to my mother that just turned 85. Yay. Uh, <laughs> from Princeton, New Jersey. Um, uh, how did I choose them? I chose them based on where I could find material that I thought would be useful to me. Uh, archives turned, about, turned out to be hugely important to this project because teaching has largely been something that happens in private. It's weird. I mean, it's a public activity, but it happens behind closed doors. Uh, and there's actually very little reliable print record on it. So I really did need archival unpublished sources to try to get at what people were thinking and feeling about this. And so I tried to find the archives where they had um, lots of records from faculty committees about teaching, lots of memoirs by professors themselves, um, uh, lots of unpublished student evaluations, which is what they initially were. And I will, I will admit that there's a bias in the sources because lo and behold, the archives that had the most voluminous and the richest material were generally rich schools like Princeton, where my mom is. Um, so there's a Princeton type bias to the book about which I'm not pleased, but in some ways I couldn't get around. Um, uh, in fairness, I did manage to get to a lot of big flagship universities, especially the Cal schools. Um, but uh, you know, community colleges, um, mid-level state universities, for-profit universities, these are not well represented. Uh, and I think that's, that's a weakness of the book. But it's a weakness of the book, but it's also indicative of the state of the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, and I think you, it, it comes through very clearly. Yeah. Um, so if I can still stick with the question about the archives, what was the biggest surprise? You know, I thought about that today because I had a feeling that you would ask. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the biggest surprise was just how much protest there's been around this subject, how much activity by students themselves um, to try to change college teaching. Um, the big errors for that are the 1920s and then the 60s and 70s. But in the 1920s, you know, there was a conference in upstate New York where representatives from over 50 colleges and universities, student representatives, showed up to debate and deliberate the question of A, why college teaching is so bad, and B, what, what can we do to make it better? Um, and that was a real revelation to me. Um, the 60s protests, I was a little bit more aware of, but even there, you know, if you think about something like the Port Huron Statement in 1962 or the free speech movement at Berkeley in 1964, you think appropriately about 
the nascent civil rights movement, the beginnings of the war in Vietnam. You know, these were political movements that were very much oriented towards and about the big political questions of the day. But at the same time, if you look at both of those uh, movements and indeed the Port Huron Statement itself, you see a lot about teaching and how bad it is. You know, the Port Huron Statement says things like, you know, the faculty are all about research now. So they're neglecting teaching. And what they're also doing is neglecting the issues we care about, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hmm. Uh, that's all in there. Um, and so I would say the biggest surprise is just the amount of both kind of organized and, uh, if you want to say, sort of subterranean, undocumented activism around this question. All right. So someone who is... I kind of want to ask two questions right now. One is about the role of student activism um, and reflecting on our times today. But I'm going to hold that for later. But the question I want to ask is, as someone who, who is in the profession of teaching as well, and um, I, I felt uh, when I was younger and I was making the decision to go into academia, this pull, right? There's this pull. If you're going to go to an R1, you have to cut corners on your teaching. And you have to, you know, that's that's a load you bear, as you say in your book. It's it's kind of your job that you have to do. And then your real passion is research, which is what you have to be doing and pursuing to excel in this field. Um, and I was in South Africa at an R1, which which I found very unsatisfying. And I moved here to a small liberal arts college precisely for the love of teaching. But upon moving here, what was interesting to me was that what I thought was a teaching institution was no longer just a teaching institution. It had transformed. And the kinds of demands that are being made of people, even in what have historically been teaching institutions, are, are very different now. Can you comment a little on how that process has happened and, and how the distinction between what is required at a research university and a teaching college have been collapsed over time? Well, this is what uh, David Reisman, who was uh, arguably the sort of greatest chronicle of American higher ed, called the academic procession. And he was not talking about graduation. You know, he was talking about the, the rows and the lines that we make and how, to your point, they end up converging. Yeah. Everybody wants to get into the next row. So a normal school doesn't want to be a normal school anymore. It wants to be a teacher's college. But actually, that's not very good. Right. So actually, this just be a regular college, but even that's not so great. So let's be a university. And indeed, the first academic job I had was at Westchester University, and it followed exactly that trajectory from normal school to teacher's college to college to university. Um, that's where the status is. And especially after the federal government gets into the grant making business, that's where the dollars are. You know, so I mean, I don't think you have to be sort of a hidebound materialist. Um, to understand how and why this, this happens. But it is dejecting because, you know, one of the themes in the book is that in earlier eras, places like Carleton were, were, were more different, if you will. You know, um, they were marked, they were salient because of their accent on the teaching function. And now to be clear, it's not that there aren't great and committed teachers at Carleton because there are, um, but, there's been a convergence. So Carlton and its friends are less distinct. And uh, everyone has their favorite quote from their book. But my favorite was when I was in the archives at Colby College, another lovely little liberal arts college. And sometime in the early 90s, they're setting up a center for teaching and learning, which everybody was making at the time. You've got one too. And this old head, you know, some, you know, like 70 or 80 year old guy about to retire, he writes this memo where he says, a center for teaching and learning? Isn't that what Colby is, <laughs> you know? And, and the answer is no, right? It's what Colby was. I think that's his point. And that's why he was so baffled by the idea. And there's this sort of, there's a painful irony there because of course, you know, very act of creating the center on the one hand, it's supposed to signal to the world, right? That you take these functions seriously, but I think you can read it in a very different and much darker way, which is, you know, we've lost sight of the function, the point that we have to establish a separate office for. Absolutely. I think it's, it's fascinating. And I love that quote. I, I, I read it and it just kind of made me chuckle because I was thinking this, this is the kind of question that occurs to me when I go to our teaching and learning center and um, suddenly we have the space where we're going to talk about it, whereas that's the entire enterprise. 
Um, let me shift a little bit and ask you to talk a little bit about um, how the mode of instruction itself has changed and, and the ways in which it's changed or not, or what are the critiques that have been of the classical kind of lecturing uh, way of delivering knowledge. Um, you write about that beautifully in the book. And the tension there is between, you know, passing on that information or education and the critiques that it is just becoming more about engagement and entertainment. And where have those critiques and attempts to reform that way of teaching, what have they led us to? Well, you know, I think the, uh, the lecture and this ubiquitous function dates to the progressive era. And it dates to two things. First of all, just the enormous boom in universities, you know, between about 1900 and really going into the 1920s. Um, many more people in seats. Um, that means you have to put them in ever larger rooms. And um, in a space like that, uh, as we know, with the chairs bolted to the ground, you're going to end up lecturing. The other thing that happens is the professoriate itself changes. Um, so, you know, you don't have these avuncular ministers like you had in the 19th century, you know, who taught courses with titles like, you know, the natural philosophy of the world or the moral philosophy of the world. You have specialists like yourself and myself um, that have got those three letters next to their name. Um, uh, this is the beginning of what in 1903, William James called the PhD octopus. Uh, James had a medical degree, but not a PhD. Um, and one of the questions that he asked, which seems to me is cognate to this entire discussion is, who seriously thinks that those three letters mean that you're a good teacher? I think the answer is nobody thinks that. James didn't think that. I don't think that. You could be, um, but you could not be. Um, and uh, the lecture starts to change, um, or I should be more precise, the lecture starts to lose its ubiquity, its, uh, you know, uh, its um, complete dominance in the 1920s because of these protest movements. What happened is places like the University of Michigan got huge all of a sudden. Um, uh, the big reasons for that was the 20s were a time of prosperity and uh, uh, women were going, like in huge numbers. So suddenly you find these student accounts of people saying, okay, I went to a room that was supposed to fit hundred. There were 200 people there. Um, I, there was a dude up front with a microphone that didn't work. He was mumbling, why am I here? Um, uh, you know, um, I'm not gonna learn from this. Even if I can hear him, I'm not gonna learn simply from listening to him. Uh, and so what you see in the 1920s are a, a wide range of different experiments, as they were called. Um, so tutorials and precepts, um, uh, kind of small groups where you meet with a generally a youngish faculty member, often somebody that is looking for a more full-time gig. Um, uh, uh, you had um, a place like Rollins College, which created this conference system where the professor and the students just got together every day to work on a shared problem. Um, you had uh, honors uh, systems being created, honors courses. You had comprehensive examinations where they just said to the juniors and seniors, look, here are a bunch of books and you'll take a comp at the end, sort of like I did at grad school. So all of that stuff is a response to the lecture. It's a very explicit um, set of statements about the way people learn. You're not gonna learn just by being a stenographer, as they said in the 20s. Right, you're going to learn um, via engagement with the material, generally in smaller groups under a professor who doesn't just talk at you but talks with you. But it doesn't quite change. I mean, then we have the Cold War, and then we have the kind of expansion and growth in enrollment um, that is, that follows. Um, sorry, follows the uh, the war. So in the Cold War period, post-war era, this expansion that then necessitates this kind of mass delivery. So there is that kind of push and pull again that we're beginning to see. It is, and that's kind of the contrapuntal and depressing rhythm of the whole book. Um, you know, uh, at every era, the university gets even huger. Mm. Uh, and so the kind of experiments, and the kind of alternatives I'm describing get ever more difficult to pull off. So, you know, excuse me, in the wake of the Second World War, you know, the GI Bill has an incredible and transformative effect on the university. By 1947, half of the students are vets, um, which is amazing, you know. Um, uh, and uh, um, the vets are very dissatisfied because they claim they got some good instruction in the army where you kind of broke into groups, you know, smaller battalions, little units. 
But they are suddenly they end up at the University of Minnesota in a class of, you know, 1500. And they're saying, you know, what is this? Um, and of course, there are replies to that. There are other efforts in the 1950s to create smaller discussion sections. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, you also see uh, um, the use of television. Um, and, you know, television, the argument was, as weird as it might seem to us, that's going to personalize things. Because instead of being in this, you know, huge room with all these other psych students, you'll be in a much smaller one um, where you can actually see the professor and you'll develop a kind of intimate electronic um, uh, relationship with him. So that was one of the solutions uh, for the time, which is obviously pregnant with meaning right now. Uh, and then, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the same thing, right? There, the boom also comes from the federal government. I mean, it comes from the Higher Education Act, which created grants and loans for students. And also the, you know, the Higher, Higher Ed Facilities Act, which is very obscure, but hugely important. Thanks to that act, there was a point in the late 60s where there's one community college opening per day on average. I mean, just the boom in higher ed. You think about this thing that was like a bunch of little colleges for white dudes um, in a hundred years, just becoming this behemoth, right? 20 million people involved in it. Um, uh, but there again, um, uh, because of these crowds, you have you know, the mass class and those critiques that I described from the poor Huron state and the free speech movement are very much targeted at that. Like, like friends, this is not working. Um, you know, I'm not an IBM card. Do not fold, bend, and mutilate. I mean, this is all the language of the day. Uh, and so what do you get from that? You get experimental colleges. Um, uh, you get so-called tea groups and encounter groups in the classroom. Um, but you also get something called the personalized system of learning in which different courses were broken into modules and you could just take them on your own and, you know, have a test after you completed each one. And this too was going to be personalized in the sense that you did it at your own pace, um, but in other ways, just like TV, radically impersonal. Um, so again, that's the that's the back and forth rhythm of the of the game. Yeah, again, it is that tension that you bring out. And so let me move to now. This is not a chronological conversation, but um, you know, TV and how you said it was the idea was that this was somehow going to make it more personal. Um, it sounds counterintuitive to us at this moment. And yet we are in this moment where everything has gone online and um, the mode of instruction is being driven not by demands by students or by reform, it's being driven by a virus that none of us can see. Um, yet the technology is making it possible for us to actually continue this endeavor. What are your thoughts in this moment as you are teaching and dealing with trying to provide this personalized experience through this medium? Well, look, it's a radical moment, just in a dictionary sense, right? Um, I, I, it's radical because there is no precedent. And I think what's really radical about it historically is we all have to go onto the machines. One of the story that I tell in the book is that when we've introduced other machines, uh, going back to radio and then television and so-called teaching machines, which is a whole other B.F. Skinner story. It's generally to bring in others, like new populations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not for people at the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach, like they didn't do teaching machines, right, or TV. You know what? They're doing online instruction now. Um, so everyone has to do it. Everyone is in the same pool. Um, you know, online instruction, you know, has a 30 year history and it predates this moment. But the difference is online instruction was generally reserved for people that aren't like me, right? Um, for people that don't work at elite colleges and universities or you. Online instruction was for the other guy or the other gal, right? Um, now it's for everybody. And I think that raises enormous, even existential questions, um, not just for education, but for our democracy. Um, a lot of my students have told me that it's just not as good, all right? And we can talk about why that is. I happen to agree with them. Um, uh, but if it's not good enough for kids at the University of Pennsylvania, why is it good enough for students at Delaware Community College? That seems to me uh, a, a, an obvious and urgent question that we're all gonna have to address. 
So this is an interesting point in the moment where, so the virus is a great leveler in this instance um, and is kind of working against all these barriers that have been constructed between elite and the other set of the population that is getting an education um, right. and what's good and what's not good. Um, let me pivot to another question of our times, which is looking at student unrest and the role that student unrest plays in um, changing how we teach and changing what we teach, um, not just how we teach. We're in a moment where there is a demand for more diversity. There is a demand for putting on the table questions that have not been addressed before. How does a historical perspective, you talk about it in your book, you talk about the student unrest, um, unrest that took place at various points and, and the impact that they had on the ways of instruction, on the ways of teaching and how teaching and what was being taught. Um, how does a historical perspective on student unrest give you a particular vantage point to see today from? Well, you know, I would say in comparative terms that, you know, there's been a huge amount of student unrest about questions of equity um, uh, and questions of race, both uh, in our university and larger society. And that was long overdue. And I think it's largely a salutary thing, you know. Um, uh, but thus far, there hasn't been a huge amount of student unrest about pedagogy and teaching. Um, you know, I think we're still waiting for that. Uh, I suppose you could call some of the petitions demanding tuition refunds, right, when the pandemic hit, an exception to that, right? Um, uh, you know, because I think that was a form of student unrest that was uh, to, uh, explicitly targeted um, at the way we're teaching, not what we're teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're still waiting to see um, how much more of that there will be. You know, um, uh, if the students say it's not as good, well, what are they gonna do about it? I mean, one thing I keep saying to my students is like, I'm on the back nine, man. Like, I'm not gonna be changing this. Like, that's gonna be up to you, you know, not me. I mean, I'm kind of done, you know? Um, uh, and so, if the students decide that this isn't good enough either for students at the University of Pennsylvania or Delaware Community College, what are they going to do about it? Um, uh, uh, and, you know, will there be a kind of organized efforts to try to change the, you know, improve the quality or even change the mode of delivery of college instruction? I think we're waiting to see that. Mm. So let me come to the question that you pose in your book, which is why despite all these moves from different sections of society to change teaching, it continues to remain the same in many ways. Um, how do we account for that? And, and from what I understand you say, it's not because we haven't learned how learning can happen. What are the best practices for that? There's been huge development in those areas. We, we know how to create the right environments to make that happen. But there's another reason. Your, your argument is that there is something else that is holding us back. So it's not lack of knowledge of how learning happens. Will yes, you it, share it, with us? It's not lack of knowledge. And uh, if you want some good evidence of that, read Daniel Gublar's book, um, which is, I think, the best recent compendium about what we've learned about college learning. And we've learned a lot. Uh, however, the title of the book is called The Missing Course. <laughs> So basically he reviews all this stuff that we've learned about the way learning happens. And then what he says, it's a little bit of a shaggy dog story. He says, well, yes, we've learned all this, but we're not really applying it because you know, most of the people that teach at our institutions don't really know anything about it. Um, uh, and their own institutions haven't required them to do so. Um, and most of all, their own institutions aren't checking to see whether they are doing so. And this brings me the title of my book, The Amateur Hour. And I've already caught um, a good deal of you know what about that, because a lot of people look at the title and they think that what I'm saying is teaching is bad. And I'm not saying that, I would never say that. I mean, that's sort of nonsensical with millions of people doing it, it's gonna be terrific and terrible and a million things in between. So it's not that teaching is bad because amateurs can be really good. 
uh, the best gymnast in my youth was Olga Corbett, and she was an amateur because back then, you know, the Olympics weren't professionalized. So it's not that they're bad. What it is is that they're not professional, and they're not professional because there isn't an accepted code of practice about what constitutes good practice, and there isn't an organized effort to determine whether we're following it. So we've got the knowledge. It's in Gublar's book, right? But what we don't have is actually a set of professional practices to inscribe that knowledge in our work and also to you know, evaluate the degree to which we're behaving in accord with that knowledge. Um, so you know, to get this book into print, uh, it had to be run by a whole bunch of scholars like yourself who know about history and they had to make comments about it and write reports about it and I had to respond to them. It's a big song and dance. And they were good reports if one of the readers is out there and they made the book much better. Um, that's called peer review. Well, look, I've been at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm starting my fifth year. Nobody has ever come to evaluate my class. No colleague, no administrator. Um, I have invited administrators to the class, but for the purpose of sharing their knowledge and understanding with the class, which is a whole different thing. They're not there to evaluate me. So what does that tell you? What it tells you is that I'm an amateur. I could be doing anything. And by the way, some people are, that's in the book too. Um, so we just don't have, we have the knowledge, but we don't have the consensus about doing something professional with the knowledge. Um, and that raises the question, that the next obvious question, which is why not, you know? And look, I, I think there are a lot of answers to that, but at the most, to use a lot of term personal level, I would say that the irreducibly personal nature of teaching is an inhibitor here. Um, and here's why. Um, I assume some of the people tonight are reading my book or have read my book, or maybe they'll just wait for the movie, all right? but. They may like the book, they might not like the book, but I have to say, whether they do or not, I will not take it personally. Either I'll read the comment, I'll say, gee, I should have thought about that. Um, or I'll think, you know, that's sort of off and I don't, I don't really have to pay it any mind because I don't think this person got the point. But in either of those two cases, um, I don't feel like it touches my inner being. If one of these administrators or colleagues comes to my class and says that I didn't teach a very good class, I didn't teach a good class, do I take that personally? Let me think about this. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, and deeply. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's been a really important inhibitor on in all of this. You know, we don't want ourselves subjected to that sort of uh, um, uh, critique and review. Uh, it's scary. Uh, so let me, let me come at you with, questions. sorry to interrupt. I mean, the, the review piece makes me think of, you know, the, the difference in the kind of institution I'm at, um, which is a small liberal arts college, which has made um, its identity um, around teaching and teaching well. And as part of someone who's not that far away from having got tenure, um, the process was grueling, not you know, for, for many reasons, but one of them was the kind of incessant surveillance, what felt like incessant surveillance. We, I think Carlton, an institution that I love, has made an art out of over-observing our faculty. And so I had countless senior professors in and out of my classes. And, and I, I have to say, I benefited from their feedback but a lot of the times the feedback was, and this goes back to your point about not having a set of best practices and a, a standard with which to, they would give me feedback from the point of view of how they do things, not looking at my strengths or my weaknesses and telling me how I could improve. And that, that is something that, you know, you hear a lot of junior faculty at institutions like mine talk about, um, but, yeah, I to talk that's a problem. I mean, I think, you know, uh, without naming any names or casting aspersions in your wonderful colleagues, my guess is that some of them had not read Dan Gublar's book, right? <laughs> um, and so it does become totally idiosyncratic. It'd be like a doctor saying, you know, uh, this is the way I take out an appendix. Like, I don't know how you do it, but maybe you should try it my way rather than like we have this body of knowledge about the best way to take out an appendix. Like, those are different. But there is this tension, right? Which is that what makes our classrooms magical, 
And what makes it work is precisely the fact that it is entirely autonomous. I feel like it's my fiefdom when I walk into my classroom. And I remember there was this, I was teaching in a new class and there was this window and I requested a shade for it because I cannot feel that no. I am fully in control until I can shut the door. I've never understood how teachers teach with open doors because no. for me, it is a sacred space where I can only animate and come alive and bring my students alive if I kind of preserve it as that sacred space. Right, so and this is why it's this is why Omna it's so hard to research, right? Because, you know, because it's exactly as you described, right? It happens behind closed doors. And I think all of us have to figure out a way to open those doors without creating some sort of like awful Foucauldian, you know, panopticon effect where everyone is doing 360 evaluations and everybody else and writing reports that don't make anything better. Um, you know, and, and look, that's a danger. And I should say the other inhibitor on in all of this, and this goes to kind of uh, intra-university politics and status, is that let's remember that um, the low um, uh, school on the academic totem pole at any big university is the ed school. Um, uh, and so, um, I, you know, at different points in my book, there are these depressing junctures where somebody from the ed school says, you know, I can, I can help you improve your teaching. And the people on the other end said, you know, I've looked at some of the students you produce for the K through 12 schools and also some of the Mickey Mouse classes that you teach. And I'm gonna take a pass on this, you know, Mr. Ed School. You know, it seems like you don't really have a good handle on how to train or evaluate K through 12 teachers. Like, I think I'm gonna draw the line on you doing the same, uh, um, uh, you know, for us. And again, some of this was fair criticism and some of it was unfair. But as somebody who spent his whole career with a foot both in uh, the education school and in the arts and sciences, I understand the status differences. They are massive. Um, and the fact that the ed school has lower status makes changing educational practice at the university writ large a harder lift. It just does. So this has just occurred to me. So how does the how does that play with the power that student evaluations then have? over assessing um, a professor. So the ed school people are considered low status, then students in many ways become the people who have the last verdict. And with the shift in from citizen to consumer, yeah. where the customer is always right, where we're pandering and we see this move towards great inflation that you talk about and almost arguably a decline in the quality of teaching precisely because we're pandering. Yeah. I mean, look, um, I, I, we could talk forever about student evaluations. And incidentally, Scott Gelber wrote a whole book about them. Um, I, but um, I, my basic take is student evaluations are important. They can tell you important things. Um, they can tell you, for example, if a professor returns written work um, in a punctual fashion, which turns out to be hugely important, by the way, to students' learning. They can tell you if the professor is on, on time for class. They can tell you if the professor makes herself available outside of class, and those things matter, right? But here's what they can't tell you, how much the student learned. It turns out that we're just bad evaluators of that, of our own learning. So when you look at, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the evaluations and you take the ones that are outstanding and then you test those kids to see how much they learned, you can't really correlate their learning with the quality of the evaluation. Um, and to your point, it turns out that the best predictor of a high evaluation is the grade that the student expects to receive in the class. Now, the defenders of the system say, well, that's because the student who expects to get an A has learned a lot. And you can count me a skeptic on that score. I mean, it, it, it's, um, uh, there's no question that it has perverted the system. And I hope people take my point. I'm not against student evaluations. I think we should do them. But the reason we've come to rely on them so heavily is we don't have other systems of evaluation. And we need both of those. We need something else. We don't want to replace student evaluations. We should be supplementing them um, with informed peer review. I like that. And from my own experience where student evaluations count for a lot, it's, it's not, the problem is not with the student evaluations. They can, as you said, tell you so much.
It's about how you lead the student evaluations as well. Yeah. We need best practices of how do you make sense of what a student evaluation says and how are different factors playing into them, um, some of which are the obvious race and gender. Um, and before I turn to questions from our audience, what I want to say is you, you talk about how race and gender and those questions actually change the nature of teaching and the content of teaching. Can you say a little more about that for, for the pe people who are going to yeah, read Yeah, well, 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 look, um, uh, you know, um, there are great books about the way that African Americans, especially um, uh, through their own effort and protest, created entirely new programs and, uh, and disciplines um, uh, uh, at the American University. So the whole Africana and Black Studies movement was really um, spawned by student protests. And uh, Stefan Bradley uh, um, has a terrific book on the subject. Um, but you know, that's about, again, that's about the curriculum, which is, by the way, really important, you know, I mean, and matters hugely. Um, but I would say that Africana studies, just like biology or physics, can be taught well or taught poorly. Um, uh, and the question of what our curriculum should be, although it's related to the question of how we teach it, it's also distinct. Um, and, you know, I think that one thing that's happened because of student evaluations is that um, professors have become more wary sometimes of addressing questions of race and gender because they feel if they say the wrong thing, that their eval will go down. And this I find incredibly depressing and in many ways perpendicular to uh, the purposes of the kind of stories that Stefan Bradley tells in his book, right? About the way that we brought all these other perspectives in. Like what good is that gonna be? What good is that gonna do if people are biting their tongues when we come to that subject? Um, but there's no question that over the past 20, 30 years, We've seen that and it's documented in my book. I mean, a lot of professors just say it. You know, they say, that's not a subject that I want to touch because a lot of my wherewithal is going to rest on my eval. And if I say the wrong thing about one of those subjects, I'll be toast. Well, in today's day and age, it's not just about the eval. It's also about professional consequences of raising things that might offend someone because offense is taken seriously in a way that is frankly in stymieing our ways of discussing really complex issues. So the most recent fire survey that's just come out about right. students and how comfortable they feel talking about certain issues shows that actually some of the most pressing problems of our times are the issues that students are biting their tongues on. And what is the kind, what is the quality of that kind of education um, where people cannot talk about these things? Right. But also this, it's not just, you know, this, to assess the quality of teaching, it's not just what the professor is doing in the classroom, it's also the environment in which they are doing it and how far they and their degree of being able to approach questions freely is shaped by the context that they're in. Right, no question. And this is why, you know, your door closing and window closing metaphor, um, although I like it, it only goes so far right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you can't close the door in the window, right? Um, because the students are all coming in with a kind of a set of predispositions and a set of cultures, right? Um, uh, that, um, you know, that they get from the larger environment, from the huge broad political environment, but also from the campus environments. And obviously, I mean, this has been a question, I think, at the heart of heterodox, you know, uh, which is, you know, which questions are we um, excluding? Right? Um, which questions are we not talking about? And there's something very painful to me about the idea that, you know, we've expended so much effort, fiscal, political, cultural, to diversify our campuses, which I think is the best thing that's happened to universities in my lifetime. But at the same time, we're not leveraging the upside of it. Mm -hmm. The whole rationale of diversity is that when we bring in people from different backgrounds, we're going to create a more rich educational environment because they're going to share ideas with each other. But if we're not creating context, as you were saying, in the classroom and, and elsewhere, where that can happen, it's like we're not getting the we're we're not like we're not getting the juice, like we're not getting the advantage of all this effort. 
That's fantastic. You've just so beautifully outlined the connection between viewpoint diversity, which is at the heart of an intellectual enterprise, and diversity as we understand it or have come to understand it more broadly. And of course, that the two are connected, but emphasizing visual or social diversity at the cost of viewpoint diversity really undermines the mission of higher education. It does. I mean, and look, it's all around us. And, you know, ironically, I think the other sad thing is it probably makes the sort of active learning strategies that we've discovered work possibly less likely, mm -hmm. um, uh, less utilized. Because if you take active learning seriously, you actually don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. And if you do know where it's going to go, it's probably not that active. Um, and so look, these subjects you're talking about, they are loaded, right? They're emotional, right? They're highly tied to students' identity. They're difficult, right? Um, uh, but, but again, you know, if, if we can't um, create environments where we can talk about them, then what's going to happen is the professor is just going to say, say a bunch of stuff, right? I mean, we're going to, or maybe there'll be a pseudo discussion in which people say things that they feel will be approved by the regime, but you won't have an actual discussion. Well, on that very depressing note. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. no, it's so true though. Um, uh, I just realized that I've monopolized you because I can keep talking to you forever. Um, and I should open up to questions. We have some great questions here. So I'm going to kick off with the first one, which is, what do you think were the original goals of higher education? What was the telos? Was it creating good workers? Was it a liberal arts education? Creating better citizens or good patriots? To what extent have we drifted or not from why we began this enterprise of higher education? Oh, wow. Can you ask a broader question? Like, I don't want any of this narrow picayune stuff. Like, I want the big picture. Yeah. Uh, well, God, how long do we have? I mean, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, um, you know, it would be fair to say that, um, especially in the 19th century, the colleges had more explicitly um, civic functions. Um, they weren't vocational because you didn't need a degree. Um, uh, uh, they were um, framed as efforts to improve human beings um, as civic actors and improve their character. And the best book about this is by my friend Chuck Dorn. Uh, it's called For the Common Good. Um, uh, and you know, I think that in the 20th century, they took on a much wider array of functions. In part, there are many reasons for it, but I think the biggest reason is that because of changes in our economy and, uh, and in our politics, formal education started to become a sine qua non for a certain kind of uh, self-sufficiency in ways that it had never been. I think that's the big story, you know, is that um, uh, higher education becomes something that you actually need to make your way in the world um, in ways that it hadn't been in prior generations. And so it does become in that sense vocational. Um, and, and that changes the tenor and the purpose of the place. Now look, I think there are still teachers who feel like they're in the business of trying to make better and more civically minded people. In fact, I know many of them. Um, I don't see my job as preparing people that are going to be bankers and lawyers um, to be bankers and lawyers. I know that many of them will be bankers and lawyers. And by the way, I have no problem with that. But I don't see my job as helping them be better bankers or better lawyers. Um, I think my job is to help them be actually better human beings, more informed, more aware, more empathetic, um, and especially more aware about difference around them. Um, the university should be a place where we learn about people that are not us. Um, uh, and, and it still is, um, but I think especially in tough economic times, that becomes an ever harder case to make. Um, I would argue that those of us who care about the humanities now, we really have to make stronger vocationalist arguments for it. 
Um, you know, uh, I know I understand we're loath to do that because it seems like you're sort of, you know, uh, um, getting your fingers dirty with filthy lucre and this should be about learning for learning's sake. But actually, there's some pretty strong numbers now that employers really like somebody with a good English degree, underscoring good. And often they, pref they prefer that person to somebody with a business degree because they found somebody with a good English degree is more likely to be able to do the things they want, you know, I, um, verbal and written expression, uh, synthesis and analysis. Um, so I think it has become vocational and those of us in the humanities have to accept that in ways we haven't. Um, and I think that that's the way that we're gonna save the humanities um, uh, is by showing people that we need them not just to be better citizens, I do believe that, um, but actually to be better at whatever job that we choose to do. So more of an instrumental or functional argument. Yes, and there are, these are not inconsistent, by the way. You can have it both ways. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Judith Shapiro that I'm gonna pose okay. now. Could you address the importance of faculty members forming a community of teachers, just as they assume there must be a community of scholars? That is, they need to learn from one another as teachers, just as they know they must learn from one another as scholars. Now, this is something you do talk about in your book, so. Yes, and I think, um, you know, I think when Judith was the president of Barnard, I think that she tried to do that. Um, and I think um, uh, she probably had more success than others because she's such a great leader. Barnard is, of course, its own animal. Every place is in Barnard. Um, but, you know, I think that since the 90s, especially, and especially the, um, uh, uh, this is a little bit of the weeds, but the guy named Ernest Boyer wrote this book where he said, you know, we have to think of everything we do at universities, um, that is research, teaching, and service in the same way as an intellectual endeavor. And what we need to do is we have to develop intellectual standards for all three. We've only done that for research. But, you know, using this term community, um, Academic disciplines are communities, and we now speak in them as such. You're talking about the historian's community, you know, the medical community, right? But the irony, the, the sad irony, I think, into this question is that those communal functions are much more explicitly exercised around the research function, right? Not around the teaching function. I think Boyer is absolutely right. It turns out to be irreducibly complex, the question of like what the best way to teach algebra is. That's an intellectual question, and it turns out to be as complex as any other intellectual question. Um, it's just we don't approach it as such. And until we create the kind of communities that do approach it as such, it's not going to change until we're actually in, uh, again, professional and ongoing discussions about the best way to teach algebra. We're not really going to improve the teaching of algebra. I have to confess, this makes me a little bit nervous because just, just what you said, you know, which is that the personal nature of teaching is the inhibitor to professionalization. At the same time, it is, it's, it's where the magic lies. Yes. It's where the ineffable, like the thing that happens in a classroom and that happens differently for different students. So yeah. I, I completely take your point, um, but I worry that it'll be, I worry about the dangers of it being done in a way that dumbs it down or takes the joy out of it, which would be well, a real, real shame. Yes, it would be an enormous shame. And that's a very real fear. And the kind of magic you're talking about, the book talks about as charisma. And I do think teaching is a charismatic act. And um, I think all of us have felt that, both as students and as teachers, when it's there and when it isn't. And back to your question earlier about our current moment online, that cannot be recapitulated online. I mean, uh, maybe little, little bits and pieces, but you know, my favorite song in Hamilton is the room where it happens. <laughs> Charisma does not happen in the Zoom room. You know, um, it happens, you know, in the classroom. Um, and there is something that is um, both magical and I think ineffable about those things. Um, and I think teaching is a little bit like religion in that way. And Andy Del Banco talks about this in his book, where he says, you know, if you look at the Puritans creating places like Harvard and Yale, you know, what they wanted was to create environments where people could feel a kind of grace. You never knew when it was going to happen. 
And in fact, it was a shun that it was a sin to suggest that you could know because God is great and you're just trying to prepare your soul for him. But one day, maybe it's going to happen. Well, you know, I think teaching is actually a lot like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you never know when it's going to happen. And by the way, you know, often it happens 20 years after you took a class. You know, I mean, it's not like people come into my class and like, Professor Zimmerman, my mind is open now. <laughs> you know, all was dark and now it's light, you know, and I'm saved. It's more like, God, that thing you did 16 years ago where you said this or wrote this on my paper. And then I started to think that and started to do that. And it's all luck. It's all grace. And just like the Puritans said, you can prepare yourself for it. I think, as I like to tell my students, you can make better odds, but there's still odds and you don't know when it's going to happen. That, and that is, that is the magic of the whole deal. It goes back to this issue of, you know, recognizing that as, as teachers, we are not fully in control and being okay with that in the classroom. Yes. Um, and I love the way how in your book towards the end, you talk about it being a spiritual undertaking in, in many ways. It's, a, it's, it's not something that you can kind of fix and pin. And I think that's the important piece to remember as we think about best practices and how to come about it, is that we don't lose sight of that thing that you cannot quantify. Right, right. And that you can't bureaucratize either. Yeah. You know, like I, this, this book is not a plea for a new set of rules. You know, uh, it's a plea for a, I, I suppose, a new way of thinking um, uh, that will engage all of us in that community Judith was referring to, um, to try not to make, you know, uh, uh, rules about the number of questions you have to ask or, you know, the number of times each student has to speak because that would be a disaster. Um, but that do change our culture um, to engage us in the intellectual questions of teaching as seriously as we engage in the intellectual questions that we write about in our books. And this is a slow process. It's not a process that happens overnight. Yes. I think one of the things that I worry about is how quickly we want things to change today. Um, and how we don't have the patience to let things work there, you know, work through. And right, right. And, and it, you know, um, universities are conservative places, just with a small C, right? I mean, you know, most of the people that run the elite ones are somewhere on the left, but there are conservatives too, you know, just in a dictionary sense, you know, um, uh, they're change averse, we are. And look, there are some good reasons for that. I mean, part of the function of the university is to conserve things, right? To conserve things from the past, like historians do, or conserve traditions, ideas, ways of being, right? That define us and we think we should hold on to, right? But that's also what makes change so hard. And, you know, one of the thought experiments I often do with my students is I say, you know, let's imagine that Woodrow Wilson or Teddy Roosevelt came back now to Princeton or Harvard, right? Um, I think if you show them kind of systems of communication, transportation, systems of uh, gender relations, systems of race relations, they would be either astounded or appalled. But then if you took them into like a big lecture hall, they'd be like, oh yeah, I remember this. Yeah, there was like this, this person up in front and they gave this lecture and then there were these discussion sections and these kind of Harry dyspeptic grad students had to leave these discussion sections. Yeah, yeah, and there were a couple papers and a test. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, so it changes really slowly. I mean, it has changed. And by the way, thanks to people like Dan Gubler, it's gotten better. I mean, there's more knowledge and there are people applying it. I know that. Again, it just hasn't happened in a sustained way because we haven't organized ourselves to make that happen. Okay, time for another question. Did your research include any women's colleges or religious institutions? And if so, was teaching different at these schools? I mean, I think this question talks to how difficult it is to, to do what you've done in this book, which is present an overview of colleges and universities that are so diverse in their orientation, in how they teach. So, well, you, um, uh, you know, I think on the religious schools, I mean, one of the things I like my students are tired of me saying is that like all of the elite schools are religious schools. I mean, they began as them, right? They're not anymore, not explicitly. So Penn is kind of weird uh, exception to that. But the, the others, right, were, you know, started by, 
quite orthodox Christian sects, you know, for the purposes mainly of uh, transmitting their doctrine and their dogma, you know. Um, I, I, as far as actually getting to the archives of religious schools, um, I failed on that front. People that are interested in this, the, the best book is by Adam uh, Latz uh, about uh, called Fundamentalist You. And I did draw at different points from that book because I think that there's some suggestion that um, some of the religious schools have done a much better job teaching. Um, uh, just to take a, you know, a, a very minor example of an important one to me, many of the religious schools still teach you how to speak. This thing called oratory, like Omni, um, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there was a time <laughs> when that was a part, a standard part of liberal education. It is not anymore. And this is why when you go to any lecture at any university or you listen to any administrator, you know, give a report. Um, uh, and I've been an administrator, I've given those reports. We're not very good at it. We're not good at public speaking. Um, but if one of your functions is to train people that are gonna go on missions, um, you're probably going to put more of an accent on public speaking, you know, and kind of all the skills and also thought patterns that go into that. Um, with respect to the women's colleges, I did get into that, um, you know, some Smith, some Wellesley. Um, and one of the things that I found is that there was a lot of evidence at the women's college that lo and behold, the women who taught there were more engaged in the enterprise than the men who taught there. Um, it's, it's hard to get your arms around this now, but of course, many of these colleges had male leaders um, uh, um, uh, for a very long time. And um, uh, a majority of their faculty were men. And one of the things I found when I looked at the women's colleges is that the women were much more invested in teaching uh, and spent more time doing it. Um, and it turns out that lo and behold, when we average it out, that is still the case. Um, uh, obviously now we're talking about huge populations and a wide variety of institutions, um, but uh, um, women are more devoted to this project than men are. One more gender divide. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, here's another interesting question. Okay. Um, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's major opinion um, in 2000 and C, uh, 2003, where she said the racial affirmative, that racial affirmative action in higher education needs to be there and it's supposed to be temporary. And the quote is 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. How do you think we're doing? Again, I need a broader question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we're doing well and not well. You know, um, uh, I think that um, uh, the ways we're doing well is that we've brought in a much wider array of racial and ethnic groups. Um, the way we're not doing well is we have not brought in a wider array of class groups. Um, so, you know, um, uh, every elite university advertises its diversity. Just look at what's on the front of the pamphlet. Um, uh, but what the pamphlet doesn't tell you is that in that glorious rainbow, almost everybody comes from the top quintile or maybe the top two. There was a year, maybe three years ago, where my institution, the University of Pennsylvania, did not accept a single student that was from the lowest quintile of the economic spectrum, not a one. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think we've done a really good job. Uh, I think historians will ultimately say an amazing job, if you think about the time frame, of bringing in different racial and ethnic groups. But again, we have to address the fact that. Um, it's been a system that's largely benefited rich members or well-to-do members of those groups. Um, uh, and it has not done well in um, recruiting and in enlisting um, people of the working class of whatever, of whatever race or background. I think points to the limitations of how we think about that. Yes, yeah, it does. Again. Yeah. So maybe one more question. <laughs> Um, what extracurriculars, if any at all, like military service or the Peace Corps or faith work or volunteer work, make you a better educator? This question's from Brian. No. Um, well, um, uh, you know, uh, the Peace Corps was where I learned to be a teacher. Um, uh, and I'm highly biased on this question. Um, but I learned to be a teacher, frankly, just by doing it. And I would add by doing it in an environment where education 
had an entirely different meaning and was practiced in a radically different way. And uh, I served in Nepal in the early 80s and um, uh, English was a required subject. And the way it was taught was, ho, this is a cat, ho, this is a cat, a song. Um, and you knew you were getting close to a school when you could hear the kids singing, yo uh, you know. Uh, and I, you know, I come in and I take a piece of wood, I put charcoal on it, and with a rock, which was my blackboard, I draw a very primitive cat. Um, and I say, what's this? And after a while, they started to say, this is a cat. And they say, I said, okay, you know, ask the kid next to you, just say, what is that? And this was something that these kids had never seen. And it really, um, it was hugely formative for me because one of the things that just reminded me was um, uh, just how culture bound all of our educational practices are. Um, and it isn't just where I learned to be a teacher, it was where I learned to think about education um, and the different forms that it takes and the different purposes that, you know, that we apply it to. Um, I could tell you my students in Nepal were the most dedicated students I've ever had. And the reason is they walk two hours up a mountain to come to my school. I was at the top of a 6,000 foot hill, as they would call it in that part of the world. And people walk from every direction up to get there. They really wanted to get there. And they hung on every word. Um, uh, I will say, however, that I didn't have any formal preparation for this. And looking back on it, I also screwed up in every which way. Uh, there isn't time enough to describe all the mistakes that I made. And that's probably not a great way to run a railroad. It makes me think what you said about how culturally bound uh, a sense of education, frankly, is. And, and I find myself... Um, as I was reading your book, I was thinking about, you know, how is, how is the relationship between the student and the teacher conceived of? Um, and how different it is over, uh, even in our times, even within my own lifetime, com coming from Pakistan, having spent time in Britain, been in South Africa, now here, how people expect to be taught and how people expect for you to deliver the material or to engage with them is so different and is bound up in, in notions of propriety and hierarchy, which are so different. And yeah. I see it with my children who are now in American schools yeah. and what is being emphasized and what isn't being emphasized. And sometimes there are moments when I cringe because I'm like, oh, why are they not learning how to do this? And it's a reminder for me that we are constantly, you know, the, these notions are culturally specific or these ideas are. Right, and, and I think, I mean, behind your very eloquent comment, I think is the question of authority. You know, what is the authority of quote, the professor, or if you will, the teacher? You know, um, what kind of authority should they exert in the classroom? Um, uh, you know, um, uh, one of the things that I try to communicate to my students is that, um, you know, uh, compared to what there is to know, I don't know Jack. Like I know more than them about the subjects that I teach. Let's hope, you know, if I don't, there's kind of a problem. Um, but universities are full of preening people that think they know way more than they do. And grad students can be actually the worst about this because they're so anxious. And I always tell my students, when you see somebody preening, just imagine they're just wearing a shirt and it says, compared to what there is to know, I don't know Jack. And everyone's wearing it. Like, it doesn't matter if you say you are or not. Like, you just are, you know? And you're just trying to move the ball forward just a little bit. And, you know, I have spent my life trying to teach myself about the history of schools and colleges, but a book like this, I mean, I gotta tell you, it's a humbling experience because I did the best I could, but like, this is not the history of college teaching. It's a history of college teaching. Um, it's narrow and bounded and blinkered and limited in a million different ways. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, or at least I hope that lots of people younger than me are going to come back to this subject and just do it way better, way better. Well, I'll just say, I'm really glad that you did say that it's a history, that just music to a historian's ear, yeah. ears in general, but I will say it is a beautiful history. Oh, and it has been 
wonderfully <laughs> documented. Are we related? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, the questions are coming in, so I'm gonna, if you if you will allow, I will ask you for five more minutes of your time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, you can tell I'm having such a bad time doing this. Yeah, I really don't like this at all. Yeah. Um, one question is, where can people buy your book, uh, and when is it released publicly? I mean, on Amazon, of course, it's yes. already there yes. for the order. Yep. Jeff Bezos is merchandising it right now, uh, <laughs> uh, and you can just with, with just a just a little missive to Jeff, it will come to your door. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, but if you can buy it at your local bookstore, that's even better. That uh, way better if your bookstore is open. Yes. You know, um, right. uh, that sometimes costs you a little more. I make every effort to do that myself. You know, I do think it matters. Um, so yes, if you can do that by all means. So fun, one final question, which is there have been multiple instances of student unrest on campuses over the years. Have there been any instances of teacher unrest? And if yes, what were the grievances about and how did they express them? Oh, wow. Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, um, I, I think that um, there have been um, union related um, uh, grievances and battles. So my first job at Westchester University, I was in a state employees union. Um, uh, it's only a minority of American faculty that are unionized, uh, almost entirely the publics, as you might guess. But I think that's one example, you know. And look, I also think it's important to remember that um, you know, uh, especially in the protest era of the 1960s, there were a lot of faculty that were protesting too. Like it wasn't just students. Um, you know, um, uh, obviously there were faculty members that were deeply involved in the anti-war uh, and the civil rights movements, you know. Um, and I think sometimes uh, we, we forget that and uh, we think that it was, uh, you know, just the students, but it was plenty of professors as well. Wonderful, thank you, John. I just wanna say, this has been so wonderful and I could honestly keep talking with you all night about this stuff. So thank you for yeah. making time and joining us tonight and for everything that you've done for Heterodox Academy and to promote the mission. You've been one of the most dedicated members and it's such a pleasure to have these extended conversations with you. Um, well, Amna, thank you so much for doing this and for your great questions. Thank also to the people in the chat for theirs. Um, and uh, um, uh, thanks to mom. Hi, mom. Yeah. Um, and before we wind up, I just want to say to the audience, if you enjoyed tonight's event um, and you're not yet a member or a friend of Heterodox Academy, please visit our website and uh, check out some more information for how you can join us. Keep your eyes on our, out for our bulletin for ways to stay involved, including a member's book club about John's book. So we're going to be hosting one at the end of November. Um, and if you, if there are many, many signups, then we might actually host too. So thank you again for joining us tonight and have a good night. Thank you.